Hi, hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Denise Barbosa, I'm a journalist, and we are here again live from the new studio, new McKinsey studio in Sao Paulo. The McKinsey Talks has already established itself as a space for live conversations with the world's leading experts on relevant subjects to the business agenda. And today's theme is the new sanitation framework, international lessons and opportunities for Brazil. Today, we welcome Jeff Gage, Managing Director of Main Advisors in the UK. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning. Gerson Kelman, former, former CEO of Sabesp and former president of the National Water Agency, ANA. Good morning, Gerson. Good morning. And Roberto Fantoni, who is here by my side, senior partner at McKinsey in Sao Paulo, currently leads McKinsey infrastructure and logistics practice in Latin America, focusing on portfolio strategy, corporate strategy, M&A, and organization. Good morning, Fantoni. Good morning. And I'd like to remind, to remind you all that you may ask questions through the session by sending an email to McKinsey-Talks at mckinsey.com. Please contribute. Your participation is very important to us. Shall we start, Fantoni? Very well. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It is a pleasure to have you all here. I will make a quick introduction with an overview of the sector, the sources of its challenges, and then the potential impact of the new regulatory uh, framework that we are about to see in the in the sector. After that, I will have a, a discussion with Gerson and Jeff so that we finally open up for questions from the audience. Uh, I'll ha I have to start saying that Brazil has very important uh, gaps in its basic sanitation infrastructure. Almost half of the population does not have access to sewage collection in the country and Almost 60% of our count counties in the country does, has coverage of less than 10% of its population. At the same time, almost a quarter of the population does not have access to treated water. And in the systems that we do have, the losses are actually quite important. On average, we lose 38% of the water treated in our systems in the country, which is a multiple of what we observe in more mature markets. Closing those gaps is, is actually quite difficult and will require significant investment. We estimate those investments to be between five and 700 billion reais in the period. The progress that we have made in, the, in, in, in actually closing those gaps have been marginal in the last years. I have to say that the, the improvement in, in water coverage has barely moved in the last 10 years, whereas the improvement in the coverage of sewage collection has only margin, marginally in, uh, increased. Those challenges, uh, there's a reason for those challenges to have persisted for so long. First, the, the regulatory framework in Brazil are done at the county level, and as a consequence, the scale of concessions is usually very small. That leads to significant discrepancies in the quality of the regulatory framework across the country and doesn't provide the operations with the necessary synergies to operate at best-in-class uh, reference levels. Given that most of the system is actually state-owned, it is prone to, to show conflicts of interest between the roles of the regulator, the operator, and the monitor. Because of those conflicts of interest, we, we, tend, to, to, we tend not to have the, the necessary uh, targets to continue improving the system in time. Finally, the fact that, that we combine public finances that tend to show important deficits with the finances of the operator leads to limited available resources in the systems to fulfill the necessary in, uh, funding requirements that I have just talked about. So it is no wonder that the gaps that I have just said uh, have been lingering for decades in the country. The new regulatory framework 
attempt to address many of those challenges. The, the first pillar of, of those changes involve providing the necessary regulatory stability to the system. It, it actually creates and enhances a federal regulatory agency in ANA. That uh, regulatory agency should observe a gradual migration of contracts from the county level to the federal level, given a few incentives that the federal government will provide. At the same time, the new regulatory framework uh, defines very clear references for improving the system. Uh, it expects to see universalization by 2040. It sets very clear quality references to be fulfilled and actually tries to limit the waste that we have in those systems. Finally, it will, it will require the necessary financial capacity in those operating the systems and those owning the concession contracts to operate them. So th that was my introduction. As I said, there are actually very important challenges. There is a reason for those challenges to have persisted. And the new regulatory framework actually attempts to, to address those challenges. Have, with that, I will, I will now uh, welcome comments from my, uh, my colleagues Jeff and, and Gerson. Maybe I'll start with you, Jeff. Uh, we are hoping to see an important change in the, se in the sector with a significant increase in investment and improvement, improvement in the underlying operations. Based on your, on your ex international experience, what role can regulators play in facilitating and actually accelerating those changes? Well, as you, as you mentioned, Roberto, I mean, uh, achieving significant improvements in service and coverage is going to require a, a very significant investment, and the majority of which I'd expect to come from the, the private sector in years ahead. So the, the primary role that I see the regulator playing is in being an honest broker between customers and the public who require service improvements and operators and investors who need to provide the capital and provide those services and earn a return. Uh, and to, to be a fair and consistent broker at a national level. And this, this specifically covers three things. I think one is around the design of regulation, uh, which is to ensure a fair uh, return on investment for investors. Um, it involves setting very clear targets for uh, coverage to be achieved by a certain date, agreeing the amount of capital investment, agreeing a rate of return, and designing tariffs that actually protect that return on investment. So that's the first piece around design. I think the second is then around building trust. It's very important to be transparent, for example, to share both operational investment, financial KPIs in a consistent and fair way that everybody can see and everybody has trust in the system. And the third is, is around enforcement. And I think this works on, on, on two, two levels again. One is around providing reasonable and fair escalation and resolution mechanisms so that uh, investors and operators can uh, appeal, and change things where necessary, uh, but also actually encouraging people to adopt new services. As we'll talk about later, one of the big challenges is actually getting people to shift across onto uh, municipally provided services. So all of that I'd wrap up under the, the banner of being an honest and fair broker, at a, consistent at a national level. I love the three themes and the, the idea of the honest broker. Gerson, from, from, from your experience in the electric power sector, what type of parallel can you draw? And what type of lesson can we, can we learn from the regulatory side of that sector? You're on. I guess you're on mute, Gerson. <laughs> That's fine. That's, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. that's the phrase we've heard the most in 2020. That's fine. <laughs> that's okay. So uh, what I mean to say is that uh, the importance of the regulators to be a, a fair broker, as, as Jeff just said, uh, can be, un we can see here in Brazil, uh, comparing, as you suggested, Fantoni, the power sector with the uh, water and sanitation sector. When you look to the power sector, we have, uh, it's, this is responsibility only of the federal government, and we have one single uh, regulatory agency, ANEL, uh, which provides very fair, I would say, 
regulatory uh, norms and rules. Uh, and the, the end result, the bottom line, is that 100% uh, of Brazilians have access to electricity, and the private participation in the sector is very uh, significant. Most of the companies are privately run, or privately owned. When you, when you look to the, so, uh, say, a, a, a receptive environment for investments, predictable rules uh, is, uh, say, is what provides this uh, framework. When you look to the water and sanitation sector, it's just the opposite, as you, Antonio, just described. We have uh, a heterogeneous regulation, some few cases good regulation, but in most cases bad regulation, different regulations. So the participation of the part, part, private sector in the water and sanitation sector in Brazil is very small. And the result is what you described. Half of the population don't have access to sewage co collection and other bad things. So what is new and very relevant in the new law is that uh, uh, the law uh, attributes to a national water agency, ANA, as you said, the responsibility to overview uh, the regulatory that, uh, rules that are made at the local level, providing as, as far as, as possible, homogeneity. Uh, the, the tariff calculation will still be uh, a task of the local agencies, but they will have to obey general rules from, uh, provided by ANA. So I'm very optimistic that there is the possibility now that the water and sanitation sector will follow the good results of the power sector in Brazil and will attract private investments. I hope that too. That's, as I mentioned, and, and Gerson alluded to now, we have ambitious uh, targets or aspirations for, for, for the sector. And actually, the, the universalization targets that we have just set for, for ha having 99% of the, of the population with water coverage is actually a tall order. Jeff, what kind of, what kind of parallel, what, what kind of successful cases have you observed around the world in, in achieving unis, universalization? Well, maybe before I, I share cases, maybe just a quick word on why this is actually important and why we should all care about it. And I'm sure most people listening today have uh, you know, piped water supply with you know, high quality water and they've got the plantations. But sadly, you know, if you don't, uh, there, there are two major impacts. One is obviously a health impact in disease, child mortality, for example, um, has a significant impact. The other is economic, uh, which typically what happens is the poorest sector of society ends up paying for alternative water supplies. And those alternatives tend to be much more expensive than a municipal supply. Uh, the burden on, you know, for example, collecting water from wells you know, disproportionately around the world falls to uh, women. Um, so there are, there are many societal and economic as well as health reasons to actually push for the coverage. And maybe to, to share three examples quickly with you. Um, one from uh, South America as well, which is Chile. So in the early 1990s, Chile actually had reasonable coverage on a water side um, coverage on wastewater was maybe about 80%, which sounds quite high, but it was quite disproportionate between urban coverage where most people had access to clean sanitation uh, and the rural uh, smaller towns and villages, which didn't. Chile went through two rounds of privatization uh, and concession contracts in 1998 and 2004. Um, and now, according to the latest figures, you know, around the mid around 2015, they've actually managed to achieve about 99% coverage, a little bit lower in rural areas, but significant. Uh, a second example in Europe, which is from Poland, in Gdansk, uh, a very specific city. Uh, they moved from a municipal operation to a, a joint private municipal operation uh, with clear agreed investment criteria. Uh, they were actually able to raise the, the, the level of wastewater coverage um, very quickly up to uh, what would be considered a leading standard by any European country. And maybe a third example in, in, uh, from Asia, which is in the Philippines and Manila. Um, and just to kind of share this one to make the point that it isn't always simple. 
Uh, in Manila, they actually move towards private operating contracts, uh, specifically with the aim to improve coverage. And at the end of the first round of contracts, they found there had been very little improvement. And when they went and, and tried to understand why, they, they found that whilst there were some incentives to build out coverage, there was fewer incentives for customers to actually switch on to those public supplies. And so they, they redrafted the contracts. The regulator played a very different role in encouraging people to close down private wells and to actually pay for a connection where it was possible. This is, by the way, a very similar model to, to the way Portugal works today. Um, and they were actually able to, to drive wastewater coverage from about 50% to 80% over a 10 to 15 year period. So hopefully those examples give you some confidence that it can be done when the, the right structures and incentives and governance are, are in place. Certainly a lot of lessons to be learned from those, uh, from those cases. Gerson, from, from your experience in the sector, can you provide us with an idea of how challenging it is to address the universalization targets that we have just said? Well, uh, in Brazil, we have a few very interesting cases of success in universalization. But uh, overall, most of the state control companies, state owned companies, uh, have contracts with the counties that do not have without targets. So we have a few success cases, but uh, most of the state-owned com companies uh, provide lousy service because they don't have targets. And you see, universalization could could come, say, in one century, maybe. So the new law uh, imposes that all concession contracts with private or public utilities should have very specific targets, and, and these targets should be credible. In other words, the company should be able to, dis to prove that has the technical capability and financial and economic possibility to fulfill those promises. Um, I didn't like the fact that the, the target of 2040 that you mentioned, Antonio, was included in the law. I think that this will be, it will be, it will be better if this will be specific in each contract, in each specific case because the need to uh, investments vary from one region to the other. And in many cases, you can reach uh, universalization much e early. In many cases, it has already been achieved. And in other cases, you have to balance the, the investments of, uh, cash flow with the ability of the population to pay for these investments. Very often, uh, the gains on productivity will offset the need for uh, in the cash for investment because uh, the, when you move from an environment of a public company to a private company, you gain a lot of efficiency and productivity. What I'm trying to say is that the same management team running a public company is much less efficient, but I, I say by, by, by all experience, it's much more, less efficient than running a public, uh, I mean, a private company, because uh, when you are in the in public sector, it's very difficult to impose a meritocracy uh, to to gain, to to buy and to contract service procurements. Are, the, diff, the rules for procurements in the public sector are very cumbersome. So uh, I, I, I believe that privatization by itself will bring a lot of um, efficiency that will, uh, many, many cases allow for universalization without uh, tariffs hikes. But in some cases, this will not be possible. I, uh, I actually attended Universal Chicago, so I can definitely relate to those concepts, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, you, you touched upon a, a, very, a, a few very important points. I would love to elaborate on one specific. It, it actually, one of the biggest challenges in universalization is actually the investments in, poor, in, in, in low density populational areas and, and areas with difficulty of, of access. How can, you, how can you make those investments viable, uh, possibly using new technologies, innovative business models? How, how would you go about that? Well, uh, you mentioned that in the new law, 
there is very intense incentives to to group the municipalities uh, rather than provide organizing the service i mean operation and regulation at the at the county level uh, the the law encourages the, uh, bundling uh, the 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 municipalities in a, in a group and providing regions and providing the service at the regional scale and then the small communities will be in this, uh, say, larger scale, taking advantage of um, scale factor. Uh, but uh, uh, one perhaps important issue here is that we should not uh, try to bring the pipes all over to, to reach all places. Small communities should be, solutions to small communities should be local. Uh, either water or sewage, you, you deal with this locally. And in terms of, of uh, technology, one one thing that I, I think that may make sense is uh, to you try to use the, the drainage system that is available. And the way to do that is to decentralize sewage treatment. Uh, if you can uh, treat sewage as, as close as possible to the source, uh, close to the to the buildings. Uh, then uh, you, you treated sewage can flow to the to the through the drainage pipes, and then you can save a, a lot in terms of uh, capex and opex. So this is perhaps a, a very simple concept that can be applied in many cases. Certainly, certainly. And Jeff, a, a, any relevant experience for international markets that we can apply here, in terms of business models, yeah. innovative technologies? to address that yeah, specific think, challenge? I, 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 I think so, but I think this fundamentally is more about design choices and business models than by technology alone. So for sure there are advancements in both water and sanitation technology, but at, at its heart, you know, for example, here in, in London, you know, we still use sand bed to filter water. This is a technology that was put in by the Romans 2,000 years ago, and we're still using it. So for all the innovation and technology, the, 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 the basic technologies of, of filtration and, and disinfection are you know, relatively stable. Um, I think with one exception maybe, which is around the change in the cost of sensors, data transmission, and the ability to monitor and manage all the decentralized systems remotely. I think that's one area where technology has fundamentally changed. But for the large part, I think this is about thinking about innovative design and business models. So for example, um, if we look to an example from Pakistan, they uh, were very keen to, to roll out sanitation facilities for a huge number of villages and towns. And the way they uh, are proposing achieving that is by standardizing design. So there will be a small, a medium, and a large treatment unit. They're fitted into standard shipping containers. They can be trucked the destination they can be built in a factory uh, with much greater efficiency they've got far less concrete and steel um, so i think the the idea of something like that where you you pre-design pre-construct and ship and then use remote monitoring uh, would allow you to bring services to the population much more cheaply and of course it is still disproportionately expensive for the last individual who gets connected it costs a lot of money so a critical principle is that those costs are shared across a much bigger population. And ideally a population that includes larger urban centers where there's much greater ability to, to pay. And hence, linking back to the importance of changing the regulation to allow that financing. Absolutely. And, and all the public utility systems actually face the same type of economic challenge. By now, we, we have said a few times that the, the magnitude of the necessary investments is actually quite significant. To, to, to make this possible. At the same time, I think Gerson referred to also the, the potential, the opportunity to improve the operations and with that get some additional financial capacity from the operations to fund the necessary investment. Maybe Gerson, you can comment on what type of drivers uh, should, we, sh should we consider in that effort to improve operations of, of of public utilities in the, the basic sanitation sector? Well, uh, in, in some, first in terms of uh, subsidies, we have subsidies that are 
<laughs> right now they are given to the companies and this is very the efficiency is very low uh, subsidies when only when necessary should be targeted to to provide to in my view to output based aid meaning that in those communities that are not able to pay for the services uh, uh, taxpayer money should very small amount of taxpayer money should be a target to pay for the results let's say cubic meter of treated sewage rather than giving money to the company this is something that is in the economic incentives uh, work but uh, because very often uh, the company gets the subsidy and improves the life of its uh, its employees rather than the, the life of the population uh, second uh, I, I mentioned before you can uh, when you go from public to private you can impose meritocracy and then the productivity of the individuals improve a lot in, in procurement and also uh, saying about the new legal the, the new law uh, much of the uh, say inefficiency uh, is occurs in the slums providing service to the slums if you enter in the brazilian slum you see a lot of small pipes across the narrow alley, alleys uh, losing water uh, no leaking uh, and people are not paying and this now uh, you can have you can enter this this slums and improve the quality of the service at the t same time improve the results for the company so there is a lot of room for uh, improving the operating performance mainly in the places that previously the utilities were unable to enter due to legal constraints that now have been removed and and how do we reduce the physical and commercial losses you, you, you seem to touched upon in the last point well you see uh, let's start with, with commercial losses uh, commercial losses uh, as you, uh, you can uh, most of it comes from from this water that is used in the slums if you have a, a, a known uh, somebody is stealing water from the utility and it's providing water to those people very expensive i have the experience when i was the president of sabes to go to the slums and, and replace uh, that, say, lousy distribution of water system by uh, something that is not, you cannot read in the, in the manuals of hydraulic manuals how to, uh, to, how to organize the system because it, in, a, in a slum you don't have streets, sidewalks, etc. But something that is much better and you, you install meters. With this change, the, the family gets a water bill uh, that entitles the family to go to the, some shopping. It becomes a citizen. Before, it, the, the person was not a citizen. Now, he has a water bill, it becomes a citizen. And paying the, the, the water bill, the monthly water bill paid to the utility is less, you know, the, the, amount, the, the payment is less than it was used to pay to the local uh, water tap that was uh, stealing water from the utility. So uh, this is a win-win situation to all, with the exception of the, the guy that was <laughs> stealing water. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and it, it succeeds. Uh, I had the yeah. experience that this can be done to decrease the commercial losses. Sabes is doing that in a very successful way, and other utilities are doing also. Now, the, the physical leakage is something different, because mo mo in many cities, Leakage is downtown, old places, old pipes, sometimes pipes older than, uh, say, 50 years. And it's not easy to replace pipes downtown when there is a lot of people, commerce and, uh, and movements. Right now, due to this pandemic, uh, the, this, this comp the companies are, are now able to go there and replace the pipes. It's, uh, it's uh, one of the very, very few good consequences of the pandemic. But, but only to conclude, um, decreasing physical leakages is not a moral uh, uh, moral um, obligation. It, it, it's an issue. It's, a, it's an economic issue. Because uh, in some cases, uh, you spend more money trying to avoid leakage than, than what you gain. So it, it depends. It's a site-specific issue. And you should look in, in each case. For example, in Sao Paulo, where you are, uh, 
we, we fetch water 100 kilometers away. So water is very expensive and it's worthwhile to try to decrease the leakage as much as possible. But if you are in a city very close to what is, is plenty, like in the Amazon River, then you have to do calculations and see what is your break-even point. But it's not, a, as I said, it's not a moral issue. It's an economic issue. Fair point. Very good point. Uh, Jeff, I, I know that you have extensive experience with operational improvement of, of, of water utilities. Can you comment on the latest thinking on, on how to go about this? On leakage specifically or more broadly? No, on more broadly in operational improvement. Uh, maybe, and then you touch upon the, the losses part. So may, maybe, um, a, again, to preface this, so I, I've worked now with 75 to 80 different water and wastewater utilities all around uh, the world. Uh, and what we see is that there is a huge level of variation in performance, both between utilities, but also within water and wastewater utilities. Uh, and from all of the work that we've done on detailed benchmarking and leading large change programs, we, we fundamentally believe that there is typically a at least a 10%, if not closer to a 20 to 30% efficiency improvement option. And that, frankly, is irrespective of whether it is public or privately managed. I don't disagree uh, with um, uh, Jason's comments uh, that you know, private ownership offers greater uh, incentives sometimes, um, but you know we, we see the significant advantage, and it means that as an investor thinking about coming into the sector, you should have a fairly high expectation or aspiration in terms of the potential improvements and then how to reinvest those. And thinking specifically about commercial and, and physical losses, I mean, the, the big difference is that if you save a liter of commercial losses, you get your revenue for that, and you've already incurred all your costs, and that drops to the bottom line. And that helps you to defer the cost of the system across a greater revenue base. If you reduce a liter, liter of leakage, all you save is the cost of pumping and treating that water. It's a much lower level. You don't necessarily sell that water as, as revenue. So I think the, the principle of focusing initially on commercial leakage, uh, sorry, commercial losses initially is, is, is very sensible. Yeah, good point. The Given the magnitude of the investments that we need in the sector, we, we expect financial investors to play a, a meaningful role in the changes that we are about to see. From your experience, Jeff, in international markets, what type of financial investor could have an interest or play a meaningful role in the sector here in Brazil? I think there'll be many who will be very excited and very interested. But importantly, they will also require local partners, both on the finance side, but also local operators. So I see this evolving very much in terms of partnership between uh, international money and, and local relationships, knowledge, and know-how. So I think that's an important point. But in general, investors that are interested in the water sector um, have to have very deep pockets. Water is much more capitally intense than electricity or gas, and we've just talked about the need to invest to increase service coverage. Uh, they typically have a long time frame for those investments, and they, they're often looking for things that are inflation-linked. So if your tariffs are designed in a way that they, they increase with inflation, the types of investors who, who are super interested tend to be pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, some of the large kind of corporate investments, you know, some of the Japanese funds. Maybe some of the more active private equity firms where they, they believe they can make a you know, relatively short impact in maybe over 10 years. But it's typically those deep-pocketed, long-term investors who primarily are looking for stability of returns over the absolute level of return. And again, that's the, that's the importance that regulation plays in minimizing risk for those investors. And, and Gerson, from your experience leading some of the, a few utilities here in Brazil, how would you frame this opportunity for international investors in the country? You see, in a, in a world that is very concerned, there is a wave of ESG, say, all over the world. Uh, investing for long term 
in an industry that uh, will clean the rivers environment <laughs> because we are going to treat half of the sewage of the Brazilian population, uh, sewage of half the po Brazilian population. Um, the possibility of bringing health to the population and jobs because uh, construction works on sanitation is job intensive. So the S of ESG is now fulfilled. And improving a lot the governance because you have you can gain a lot of, on productivity and, and setting the, the, the uh, regulatory environment that Jeff just mentioned, that it's predictable, gives stable returns. I, I, I think that, and, and given positive returns, you see in Sao Paulo, for example, the regulatory agency just uh, uh, set the rate of return of the investment in eight, something like 8%. So right now, uh, being able to invest in the 30 years with ESG and, and a positive and significant rate of return seems to be a dream to all to any investment. Depends on us, Brazilians. Depends on us, Brazilians, to fulfill the promise of the law. This means that the law allows the creation of a good environmental for regulation, and we have the responsibility to to really deliver that to to make sure that whoever brings money here will have this predictive, it's, it, it has the stable rules, uh, stable rate of return, provided, of course, that, pro that uh, provides good services. So, uh, so uh, I, I think that there is a very good opportunity of win-win here. Brazilians will win and investors will win. Fantastic, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic, very good points. I will now turn turn over to Denise, who will guide us through a few, a, a couple of questions from the audience. Yes, thank you, thank you, Pantoni, Kelman, and Jeff. And so now I have a, here, yes, a few questions from the audience. The first question is to Jeff. In your experience, what role can startups play in terms of providing technology, innovation, and efficiency to the water and sanitation sector? Can you point out a few successful examples of this relationship between startup ecosystem and public sector? I, that's a, it's a great question because I, I, I know I had said earlier that, that there is a, at one level, there is a limited level of technological change. But I think importantly, there is a, there is an absolutely massive upswell in the water sector of uh, startups, um, new technology companies, new service companies, new companies with new different business models that have the power to, to change things. And if you talk about reducing leakage, one example, this is a good example where there is a whole host of changes and new developments in terms of sensors to listen to leaks, to be able to detect when pressure changes, to be able to control how the distribution network works. Um, I think the important thing, again, is that the larger utilities are actually incentivized to deploy technology. This is, again, something to think about in the regulatory framework. Uh, and I think, importantly, the, the, the relationship uh, between the startup kind of ecosystem and those utilities is tight in the sense that the utilities actually share what their priorities are, what their needs are, and they find ways of working together collaboratively to pilot, to trial, and then with a genuine commitment to roll out, recognizing that they have a, a role to play to support the startup ecosystem. And I think if, if you're running a water technology company or a, a digital startup with solutions, you need that tight connection with the utilities to actually pull your ideas and solutions to actually then deploy. And Fantonio, a question for you. Regarding the development of water sanitation segment, considering all investments, how can steel industry contribute to boost or to boost this process? How do you think steel can change the current scenario? Or the regulation? Yeah. Uh, the water sanitation segment, mm -hmm. considering all investments. How can steel industry contribute? Steel? Steel? Yeah, I think something is a little. <laughs> I'm so gonna... this is uh, 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 maybe I'll comment on on some of the investment uh, themes that that are arising. I think this is a huge opportunity 
for for <laughs> for companies in related fields. Uh, I think the, the the question is refers to still the same point applies to cement and some of the building materials that, that go with it. I think there will be a number of players that will be considering investing in, in, in the sector along with an operator and a financial investor. I know a few clients of, of ours that are actually looking into this with a, as a potential opportunity to, to open up a new segment in their, in their business portfolio. And, and I, I would say this is, this is something significant. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank again Kelman, Jeff from the UK, and Fantoni right here by my side. Thank you very much for your contribu contribution here. It was great hearing from you guys. And um, I'd like to thank you also all the participants who's, who sent us their questions and all of you who spent the last 45 minutes with us here. For a complete McKinsey Talks agenda, visit McKinsey Talks. Dot com. There you can see previous episodes. Today's episode will be there on Monday, and the audio version is also available on Spotify. So thank you again. Thank you. See you the next time. Have a great weekend. Bye.